Now, there's something that we need to get out of the way immediately. If you're detecting an accent, you are quite right. I do live in East Tennessee. <laughs> I, I do live in East Tennessee. I, I'm, a, I'm a proud Tennessean as of three years ago. Uh, Butler, Tennessee, right up in the northeast corner. So I'm in southern Appalachia, so there's some Tennesseans here. Uh, my son is at the University of Tennessee, um, so I spend some time there as well. Um, but, but go Vols, okay, great, this is great. I didn't expect that. Um, so I'm coming at this from both a, a British perspective as a policymaker, but since I moved to the US uh, in 2012, I have an American wife, and you're about to see my three Anglo-American boys. I've been working on issues of inequality, social mobility, racial gaps, and education. I did that in the UK government before I moved here. I've done it at Brookings for 10 years. And as you've just heard, I've now set up a think tank to dig into it uh, a little bit more. But before we start talking about the problems of boys and men, I think we need to just take a pause and ask ourselves quite an important question, the question that I'm often asked when I embark on a presentation like this. Why? Are you not paying attention to what's happening to women and girls? Really? I mean, no, really. Really. Are you serious? Indeed, even embarking on writing a book caused many of my friends and colleagues a significant amount of concern on my behalf. That this was seen as like a no-win issue. Why would you do that? You've got a decent reputation. You know, a nice little perch at the Brookings Institution, which is a bit like a medieval sinecure. You know, just sit, you know, just, it's great. Um, you write papers occasionally, you go on to NPR. It's fantastic. Why would you do this? So I'm going to say why. But first of all, I just want to echo the comments that have just been made. Part of the problem with this debate is that you are dissuaded from really taking very seriously some of the statistics and problems I'm about to show you because it's framed in a zero-sum way. To care about the problems of boys and men is by definition to care less about the problems of girls and women. Right? The basic presumption is, and it's an insulting one, to policymakers and policy wonks is that we can't think two thoughts at once. All right? We couldn't possibly do two things at once. We couldn't possibly say, well, this group are struggling over here on this dimension, and this group are struggling over here on this dimension, and why don't we tackle both problems? No, no, no. That's the problem with so many of our debates. It's not just this debate. It's zero-sum. And zero-sum thinking is the enemy of a healthy political culture and of good quality policy making. It takes us away from the data. It takes us into preconceived positions. It makes you forced to choose. It's like saying to the parent of a son and a daughter, have you decided which one to care about yet? <laughs> we would think that was absurd, but sometimes that's the frame that's applied to this. And so to be clear, there are huge things we still need to do for women and girls across a whole range of issues, from political representation, leadership, in government, but also in big business, in tech, et cetera. Huge amounts of work to be done. And one more data point is that only 2% of venture capital money goes to female founders. Now, that might seem like an odd one to share with you, but my wife is trying to raise money from venture capital uh, companies as a female founder. And so I get in real trouble if I don't every time say that statistic because I'm reminded of it on a daily basis. Don't forget to tell them about the 2% of VC money. I'm like, it's an education audience. They don't care. But <laughs> if you're watching, honey, and if you are a VC, by the way, email me. Not really why. <clears throat> it's not like there haven't been books before. If you've been in this space, this is uh, Hannah Rosen's book 10 years ago. She's slightly recanted now, actually, but based on an Atlantic essay, good descriptive reporting about some of the issues I, I've covered. Kay Heimowitz from the Manhattan Institute, a sort of more center-right, thoughtful take on similar issues. This book, Zimbardo and Coulomb, which was more psychological in its kind of approach. Man Out by Andrew Garrow, published by the Brookings Institution Press, my publisher, just a few years before. The Boy Crisis by John Gray, Warren Farrell and John Gray. There are plenty of books out there, so... Do we need another one? Well, I think we do, but I'm not the only one. So does Senator Josh Hawley, the junior senator from Missouri, who just published his own book, Manhood, The Masculine Virtues American... I'm sorry, let me do that again. Manhood. <laughs> senator Hawley and I have some substantive disagreements 
uh, real ones and important ones, which uh, I won't have time to get into here. But nonetheless, it shows you that there's interest. So here you go. Here's another book. Really? We need another book? Yes. And I'm going to explain why in a minute. But more than that, we need a new think tank. Yes, I'm that guy. I'm the guy that looks around the world, everything that's going on, and says, you know what we need? A new think tank. Said no one ever. But in this case, it's the first and only nonpartisan think tank focused on the issues of boys and men in a non-zero-sum way, in no way in competition with the necessary work that's still being done for women. But it is time, I think, to just give ourselves permission to look at some of these gender gaps in both directions. That is the mission of our organization. I encourage you to go to AIBM.org, uh, check out our work, follow us, et cetera. I'm just going to wait till you all get your phones out. OK, so things like, well, one reason I've done it is because I have three boys, right? and all scholars are working in an autobiographical way, to some extent. It's just a question of whether we admit it to ourselves or not, right? Why was I obsessed with up upward mobility? Because of the family that I grew up in and what I heard, the stories I heard from my fathers. You know, why, why have I worked on anything? There's always some personal reason. Here are my three sons, all now in their 20s, 22, 23, 27, I think. Changes all the time. Pretty sure that's right. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. Maybe 24. Anyway, here they are. They're all taller than me now, which is why I'm not in the picture. This is North Wales, which is where uh, my mother is from, and they went back to visit uh, this summer. So I'm very proud of them. And as we're talking about like, the, the world they're growing up in, actually questions about masculinity, questions about what to do, what not to do, how to be, their role. This was like dinner table conversation. And, some, and they struggled in school in various different ways. Now, to be clear, they're not the boys I'm most worried about, except at a very personal level. At a personal level, they're the, they're the boys I worry most deeply about, of course. But as a social scientist, the, the boys with their kind of background are probably going to have the sort of supports they'll need, even if they are struggling in school. But I have to tell you, one of my biggest regrets as a parent is that when one of my sons was just really struggling in school, a school environment that wasn't structured very well for him, which is true for a lot of boys, given the issues that he was having, my, this was a long time ago, my presumption was that there was something wrong with him and that somehow or other we had to fit the square peg that he was into the round hole of the narrowly defined education system. And I'm ashamed to say that very often I was the hammer. And I wish I'd known then what I know now. It just wasn't working very well for him. And it's not that I wouldn't necessarily have sent him to a different school, although I would have liked that option. It's that I would have had more compassion, right? As you see, I only have boys, but even though they didn't have a sister, I found myself thinking, why aren't you more like your sister? <laughs> I had an imaginary sister that was doing well at school and turning her homework in and all that stuff. <laughs> I'm ashamed of that. So I'm being honest with you. I think that's part of the reason I realized too, because I actually think as a society, we're not doing a good an, enough job of showing compassion to what's happening to our boys and men. That's a problem. Here's another reason why I wrote the book and I've got a new think tank. This is from C.P. Scott, the founder of the Guardian newspaper where I spent many years as a journalist. Comment is free, but facts are sacred. The sacredness of facts is probably something that this audience will agree with me on. And so everything I do and everything we try to do will try to be empirically based, fact-based. We'll try and call it as we see it rather than only seeing the things we want to call. An audience like this has very often heard the phrase, even the promise that we will have evidence-based policymaking. Have you heard that phrase? Hands up who's heard that phrase. We're going to have evidence-based policymaking. Actually, what we very often get is policy-based evidence-making. Right, go find me some evidence that this thing's working. I've spent a lot of money on, and political capital on this, so I really need some evidence that it's working. And you can always find some evidence that something's working. Trust me. I've actually thought sometimes of setting up a, setting up a different think tank, which would make me a lot more money, which would be called something like, we'll prove your policies working.org. <laughs> Just throw some survey together. Don't worry about the response rate. Um, so yes, facts, that's hugely important part of it too. So what I'm going to do in my time with you here is to be relatively brief before we get to the conversation and cover these areas. I'm going to focus more on the second, on education, given the nature of this audience, but I am going to touch briefly on these four areas, which are 
the, some of the key themes of my work and the Institute's work with a cross-cutting theme of racial inequality and a particular focus on black boys and men, which I will get to in a moment. So I've got 30 minutes, 20 minutes left, and I just saw a thing you're going to get an evaluation, right? So you have to say what all the speakers were like and everything like that. And I'm old enough to remember they were written, right? They're online now, but they were written down. And they would be sent to you as a speaker afterwards. This is years ago. And I got these notes that would come to me. Here are the anonymous feedback. And one of those was a note. And on the front of it, someone had written, if I had 30 minutes left to live, I would choose to spend it listening to Richard Reeves speak. And I turned it over, and it said, because it would feel like a lifetime. <laughs> I still don't know who that was. Ha, ha, ha. Anyway, you are forewarned. <laughs> okay. So having done all that, I'm now going to turn to some very troubling statistics. And I know that you've heard from Jonathan Haidt, who is an advisor, I'm proud to say, uh, to the American Institute for Boys and Men, and has just written an article for us titled, Why I'm Worried About the Boys Too. And I know he alluded to that yesterday. So I'm going to start with uh, suicide rates. Everybody knows, I think, if you've been paying attention, that suicide rates have risen in the US much more so than in other countries. And that's true for both girls and boys. So if we look here, uh, this is the suicide rate per 100,000 in 99, and then the arrow ends at 2022 for women of these different age groups. And you can see that it's risen. There's up to six, eight, and seven for those different age groups uh, over that time. And so that's a big percentage increase that we've seen for those groups of girls. It's risen for boys and men as well. Uh, and the overall risk of suicide, of dying from suicide, is four times higher for boys and men in every age group. Uh, and so you can see where, they, where they've ended up now. Actually, in recent years, we also, to give another plug, we've just published uh, today a piece on suicide, male suicide. And the recent trend uh, since about 2010 has been much more among young men. So in the first decade of this century, uh, it, was, it, was middle, it was rising among middle-aged men much more, which I think is consistent with the deaths of despair story and what was happening to the economy. But since 2010, uh, suicide rates among middle-aged men have leveled out, but suicide rates among young men have really started to take off by about 35%. Obviously, every life lost to a suicide is a tragedy. Last year, 40,000 men took their own lives, 10,000 women, which is more than we lose in car accidents. So... If you wanted a public health issue, here it is. And one of my frustrations is that, again, it's a think two thoughts at once question here. There are obviously huge issues around the mental health of teen girls, especially, and I know you've, you've heard and read a lot about that, but there are also real problems for a lot of young men, and it just plays out differently. And this is the most tragic way in which the difference shows up. But to not pay attention to this, I think, is irresponsible. And we're not paying enough attention to it. I think as a general proposition, one of the reasons I'm doing this work is there are real problems for boys and men, and policymakers at every level are failing to react quickly and strongly enough to those problems, maybe for fear of zero sum, maybe because they don't know yet, and maybe because it's what Ezra Klein calls a narrative violation, right? The idea that you'd look at gender gaps the other way violates our narrative about what gender inequality looks like. It's really hard for us to get our head around the fact that sometimes now it's going the other way. Let me focus now on education. You've already heard a bit of this. So if you go back to 1972, 7072, important because that's when we passed a lot of legislation, Title IX most famously, to encourage women into college. There was about a 13 percentage point gap uh, in favor of men. So if it's above the line, this is showing you the gap in favor of men. It started to drop. Caught, women caught up in the 80s, overtook in the 90s, and then accelerated the lead. And so by now, we actually have a slightly bigger, as you can see, a bigger gender gap in terms of the share of college degrees going to women versus men than we did in 1972 when we passed Title IX, but it's the, it's, so it's the other way around. We have slightly wider than Title IX level inequality, but the other way around. And if we look by race, and this is a big part of our work, they strongly intersect. So this shows you of the college degrees being awarded to black students and white students, I've just chosen those two for simplicity, what share go to male and female? And what you can see is that there's a gender gap at every level for both white and black, but it's much wider for black. So for every, every black man getting a college degree, there are two black women 
getting a college degree. And as a general proposition, every gender inequality in education I'm going to talk about is wider for black students. It is, in my view, borderline irresponsible to look at education data by race if you're not also cutting it by gender. You miss the extraordinary progress that's been made by black women and girls. Not that we're there yet, in case I have to add that. And we miss just what's happening to black boys and men. Right? Always cut it the other way. Now, some of this stuff in college is predicted by what's happening in high school. So I'm focusing here on GPA. Take all the high school GPAs and rank them from the lowest to the highest by decile. You're a wonky crowd, so I'm not going to explain what a decile is. Right? Bottom 10. So you're, you're a very wonky crowd. I'm, I'm, I'm still a scholar. I have charts for everything. Um, my wife says, how was your day? I said, I don't know, median, mean. <laughs> Do you want the standard deviation? Just follow me on Twitter. You wouldn't have to ask this question every night. All right, two thirds of the bottom tenth by GPA are boys. And two thirds of the top 10% are girls. So there's a massive skew in high school GPA. If you're a selective college and you're largely taking from the top end of this GPA distribution, you're already looking at a pool that is two-thirds female. Right? So it's not surprising that we see those changes on college campuses. But interestingly, there isn't that big a gap on standardized tests, SAT and ACT. Right? It's narrowed and it's not that big anymore. Which means that when a college goes test optional, the main effect is to increase the share of women by about four percentage points. Right. I'm not saying they shouldn't do that. I'm just saying that is a very well proven, I think by a very good paper from Vanderbilt, a, a proven effect. Of course, and you think about it for a moment and say, well, duh, if the only admissions criteria where, there is some, where boys are holding their own is tests, and on every other one, especially GPA, they are way behind take tests out, you're going to skew more female. Again, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I think we should do it with our eyes open. Right? It is going to have that effect. It's the biggest effect by far of going test optional. Now, why would, why would GPA be so skewed, whereas things like standardized tests are not? Well, it's because the things that cause you to do well in GPA are not the same things. Right? So now I'm, going to do, now I'm going to be a neuroscientist for three minutes. Okay? Are there any neuroscientists in the room? Oh, no. Yes, of course. Of course. OK. Well, hopefully you won't choose to spend much of your time correcting everything I've just said. Right. So um, there isn't much difference in male and female brains, but there's a bit of a difference in when they, when they develop. So what I'm going to show you here is from 10 to about 24. So through the teen years and up to about 24. This is Elizabeth Shulman's work with uh, Larry Steinberg and Catherine Page Harden. And what this is showing you is that the average levels of impulse control across those age ranges for girls. Impulse control is like the brakes on a car. It's the thing like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. That's not a good idea. I'm going to defer gratification, marshmallow, et cetera, right? I've got future orientation. I'm going to be able to, to stop myself doing something. And then there's something else, which is sensation seeking, which is the orange line, which is hell yeah. That's a great idea. Right? Maybe I don't need to go to bed and study, right? And you can see that what happens in, ad in adolescence is that this sensation-seeking thing really, really peaks, right? That's why the teen years are difficult, right? They call it, in like the gas and the brake, right? So if the impulse controls the brake uh, and the sensation-seeking is the gas, it's just like the, we get a little bit out of whack, and then you can see that it goes. this is uh, impulse control for boys. Same pattern, a bit lower. This is sensation seeking for boys. Okay. So what this is telling us is a couple of things. There is good neuroscience behind the fact that your teenager is a hot mess. <laughs> You're not alone. But it also tells us there's a huge difference. It's in the timing of this development. And it turns out that those years where you see that really big gap are crucial for education. And most importantly, they're crucial for high school GPA. Right? Because the, the impulse control bit is the one that says, is the one that helps you do your chemistry homework, right? Doing your chemistry homework as a 15-year-old requires you to be in your chemistry class, be paying attention, make a note of the fact you have homework, remember later you have the homework, do the homework, and then 
most importantly, turn the homework in. <laughs> There's barely a 15-year-old boy on the planet that can do all that, <laughs> unless his mum or dad are looking over his shoulder. Uh, and so there's just this difference in non-cognitive skills, right? In these CEO of the brain skills, in the get your chemistry homework done skills. Girls are not smarter than boys or vice versa, but girls do develop a little bit earlier. And those skills predict GPA. They don't predict particularly strongly standardized test scores, right? So there's this developmental gap between boys and girls. When I wrote this chapter, I had a, a feminist uh, scholar who is a neuroscientist, and she put, well, duh. Tell us something we don't know, Brookings scholar. I'm like, okay, so if it's so everyone knows this and it's blindingly obvious, should it in any way influence our education system? Just a thought that maybe it should, right? If it's so blindingly obvious to everybody that a 15-year-old boy is not the same as a 15-year-old girl at the average, maybe that matters? I don't know. I'm going to argue that it does. The other problem we have in, in education is fewer and fewer male teachers. In 1980, when Ronald Reagan came to office, 33% of K-12 teachers in the US were male. Now it's 23% and dropping. 10 percentage point drop in the share of men in classrooms. I think that matters because the profession's getting more gendered. That's get, and then it gets even harder to get men in. Is that, let's do a quick show of hands. Who thinks that a onward declining share of men in K-12 education is a bad thing? Hands up. Hands up who thinks it's a bad thing. Okay. Who thinks it's a good thing? Maybe you're just not brave enough, but no one I think has put a hand up. And who thinks it doesn't matter? It's just a thing. Hands up who's neutral now. Okay, a couple of those. All right. So I don't know what the scores were. Then, but it looked like about 99% bad thing. All right. Again, and your policy responses are? Our policy responses are? the national crisis headlines that come every year when this data is published are nowhere to be seen. Especially in younger ages. Men are declining in most in high school. We're almost parity in post-secondary. And there are basically no pre-K. I think that's pre-K and K, actually. But there are about half as many men teaching kindergarten as a share of the profession as there are women flying fighter planes. To be clear, I want women. Actually, I just want people who are good at flying planes. <laughs> flying, but, uh, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> so now I'm going to briefly touch on a couple of other things, wages and work. There's been a profound transformation in the labor market in recent years, particularly in the US, which has had an effect on the wages of both men and women. This shows you the change in wages uh, at the median, so that's in the middle, uh, women in light, men in dark, the 20th percentile, so at the bottom of the distribution, and the 80th percentile at the top of the distribution. So wages have risen for women across the board, but especially at the top. So a big growth in wage inequality for women. Uh, but for men, the only group of men that are actually better off today than they were in 79 are the ones at the top. So if you spend all your time with upper middle class people who may have married each other, then you're seeing the people who are on the right hand side of this chart, right? Women have seen massive wage gains at the top of the distribution. Men have seen some wage gains at the top of the distribution. If they then form a household, that massively drives income inequality. But it also means that if you spend your time with those people, you might be sitting there thinking, what's he talking about? The men I know are doing fine. Well, they might not be doing fine on some of the other issues, like mental health, but they probably are doing OK economically. But that doesn't mean working class men are doing fine. I used to live in Bethesda, Maryland. I now live in Butler, Tennessee. And let me tell you. Just because the men in Bethesda, Maryland are doing okay does not mean that the men in Butler, Tennessee are doing okay. But the people in Bethesda don't spend much time with the men in Butler. And so they, I, that, it takes me longer to persuade them there might be something here than it does in my neighborhood. And the other thing I'll say just in terms of employment, because I think it matters for all kinds of reasons, but it matters in the labor market, we're emptying men out of what I call heel professions, so the antonym of STEM, but health, education, administration, and literacy. You can see that the, like, the purple line in the middle, that's teachers have already done that. Psychology and social work are becoming female professions. Again, back to 1980, you can see that they were not female professions. They are becoming female professions. Among psychologists under the age of 30, 5% are male. We're turning our mental health professions into female professions. Does that matter? I think it does. And I think we would definitely think it mattered if it was the other way around, if we wanted to have a diversity of provision. The only one that's gone up is nursing. Maybe not coincidentally, the only one that's seen a big pay rise. 
And then last, I'm going to say a little bit about family and fatherhood, and then give you some solutions that we could discuss, and maybe uh, I can try and persuade you to do some of them. First of all, I'm going to draw on Melissa Carney's work here. She has a new book out, The Two-Parent Privilege, which I recommend, even though I disagree with her about certain things. And Melissa's basic point is that the default of having kids in marriage has, has changed. So if we look at the share of children born uh, to married parents in 1990 versus today, this is college-educated parents, four-year or above. It was 5% born outside marriage, and now it's 11%. So doubled, but still very low. The action is elsewhere. Those with high school, associate's degree, or some college, doubled from 25% to 52%, uh, and those with less, from 52 to 66. Of course, there are fewer people in that group. There's a compositional change. But the basic story here is that for everybody except college-educated Americans, the norm is to have children outside marriage. That's the norm. Right? And that's a dramatic change, as you can see. And that's partly driven by our failure, I think, to update our views about fatherhood and families. We're still stuck, I think, in some of the models of how families work. We're in this very difficult transition, and we're not making a very good job of it. And as a result, there is fatherlessness. And that's very bad, but it's especially bad for boys. Male disadvantage is more inherited because men struggle, boys do worse when their fathers struggle, they then struggle, they struggle to form families or to be engaged fathers. And so the cycle turns. One of the most striking findings in social science is from Raj Chetty, showing neighborhoods with lots of dads in them the kids did better. Even if their own dad wasn't there. All right, let's do some solutions in my last few minutes. I do really want to be solutions forward. But before I run through these, these are pretty wonky. I'm going to make a cultural point. I strongly believe, and it's why I'm staking my career on this belief, that our failure to address these issues of boys and men in an empirical, straightforward way a failure sometimes even to acknowledge them. There is nothing on the CDC website about the gender gap in suicide. You have to really dig for it. Lots of other disparities are there. Right, we're just failing. Our failure to address it just in this way, in this intensely boring way, that I've just done it for you. I haven't mentioned the Barbie movie once. <laughs> is what we need. Right, so that if, I, if we have young men or boys who are struggling in school or in life or in dating, that they don't feel unseen and unheard. Because if they feel unseen and unheard, they will go and find someone who does make them feel seen and heard online. And we probably won't like who that is. But it's our fault if anyone in our society feels unseen and unheard. If they feel like their problems, whilst not necessarily better or more important, were their problems are being taken as seriously as other people's problems in a non-zero sum way. And too many of our young men and boys don't feel that right now. That's a huge problem. So what should we do? Okay, here's an idea. Let's start boys' school later. We develop later. Lots of rich people do this already. And I've been saying publicly, start boys in school a year later. But Jonathan Hai had, had a chat with me last night. He said, why do you keep saying a year? Why not do six months? The evidence is that actually it's the younger, younger ages that do it. And I said, well, how would that work? You just, you should just set the dates like that. I was like, I've been thinking about this for two years. And I didn't come up with that idea. So I've changed my mind in the last 24 hours. It doesn't have to be a year, but maybe six months. I am looking for someone who wants to do this and pilot it. I have a foundation who will fund an evaluation. I have academics who will conduct an evaluation. I had, do not have a school district or school or policymaker who is willing to pilot this. So please tell me if you're interested in this and piloting it. We also need more technical high schools, vocational training generally and learning, favors boys, seems neutral for girls, something about the scale of the training, the underinvestment in the US in vocational forms of learning is bad, period, but it turns out to be especially bad for boys and men. We need better alternatives for them. And I would suggest we can comfortably afford another 1,000 technical high schools, which show very good results for boys. Oh, by the way, maybe that apprenticeship bill could move. I don't know how long it's been sitting on the floor of the Senate, but a while now, so that we can't be the worst country in the OECD on apprenticeships. Can we have more male teachers? Could you, could you agree with me that Reagan era gender diversity in K-12 would be a good target. A third of our teachers should be male in K-12, right? Can we set that target? Can we start doing something about that? Can we at least recognize it as a problem? 
on higher education with the massive dropout rates we see from men. Being male is the biggest risk factor for not finishing college with the right controls. Let's have some male resource centers. I propose economic scholarships to get men into those professions just for men. Wait, what? Just for men? Yeah. By the way, I want to keep all the scholarships for women into STEM. Right? I don't want to get rid of them. I want to keep them. I love the scholarships for women into STEM. But if we're going to have those, why is it unthinkable when you see the numbers I've just shared that we would actually try and incentivize men into those professions? Let's at least try it, see if it works. And then because uh, I'm a European, I want wildly generous paid leave for mothers and fathers. Um, and most importantly, for fathers to know that they matter as fathers, even if they're not married to the mother. These are wonky. I have more. I want your ideas. But I don't think the stakes here are just as I said about policy and wonkiness. I think the stakes here are quite high. We're losing too many of our men and our boys, either to the tragedy of suicide or to a death of despair or to substance abuse or to hopelessness of some kind or another or to the grip of reactionary forces because they don't feel like we're doing this stuff for them. And my mission in life is to try and address that vacuum. We cannot leave a vacuum because someone will fill it. And I would much rather that was us than them, the online manosphere figures. So with that, thank you for your attention and looking forward to talking to Katie. Please welcome the Secretary of the Indiana Department of Education, Katie Jenner. Well, I'm going to say something with love in my heart, which always makes people nervous. Yes, it makes me terrified, in fact. Uh, There's a very big but coming after that sentence. I am really glad our first session was on happiness mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because what you just shared um, is a lot to process. And I think I shared this with you honestly on the phone. Richard, I, I serve as Secretary of Education in Indiana. I have for two years and 10 months. Your book was the first one I'd ever read on men and boys. Mm -hmm. And I'm embarrassed to say that, but I know that because I've talked to some of my other colleagues, it resonates with some of them as well, that it's not a topic that we've talked about a lot. Why is that? Why, why you pointed out the books on the screen mm. that have been published, mm. but in terms of the circles, why aren't we talking about this more? I think it comes back to this sense of zero sum. So I'm talking to a lot of people now and they'll say, sometimes say something like, well, of course you're right, but I couldn't possibly say that here in the school district or the campus or the, wherever it is. And I say, well, why? And I'll say, because people will think badly of me. They will, they will think, oh, I, I mean, one of the opening questions I got uh, when I was out talking about the book was, why do you hate women so much? Right? And it's a good question mm. because it gets straight into that. If it's in the room, let's talk about that, right? So it's really, because... It's a vicious circle. Yes. If the people talking about the problems of boys and men are pretty reactionary, yeah. right? And they do think that basically the problem is that we've got women rising and being things like secretaries for education, that that's why men are struggling, right? Mm -hmm. And because they're dominating the debate, especially online, it means that anyone who draws attention to this stuff is mm -hmm. immediately categorized with them. So it's interesting, um, reading your book, you, you spiral that message pretty intentionally mm -hmm. over and over. I mean, I get it. it was good. I appreciate it. <laughs> good point. No, no. Um, great, great plug for the book, Katie, thanks. Um, so this Sunday, flipped on the TV, mm. my dad growing up, always watch Sunday morning mm -hmm. with a big cup of coffee, CBS Sunday, Sunday mm -hmm. morning, mm -hmm. um, every single Sunday before church. And uh, so I do that too, most Sundays. Absolutely. And some of the segments I like, some I disagree with, mm -hmm. but that, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. But you were on mm -hmm. 
just this past Sunday, mm -hmm. CBS Sunday Morning being yes. featured. Yes. And what was interesting is they interviewed three students. You know the part I'm talking about? I do, yeah. Three students, one boy, mm -hmm. college boy, yep. two college girls, mm -hmm. and they asked the question, kind of like what we're talking about, which is, um, can you advocate for women and also advocate for men, mm -hmm. um, which I believe wholeheartedly you can and should. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really interesting to hear the, the college girls' take on it. Um, they were really more like, no, we, we have to keep advocating for women. Did, yeah. I mean, did you pick that up that they? Well, I noticed that actually he didn't speak in that segment. Well, uh, he spoke second. They got their words later, in they first. Got to, they brought back to him later, yeah, but it opened yeah. with a segment of the three of them, two women and a man. And yes. the, it was a piece about men in college, and the, the woman on the left spoke, and the woman on the man spoke, and he was just stopped still in the middle. <laughs> uh, right. It was actually quite emblematic, I think, of how a lot of men you know, feel about this. Uh -huh. um, so they did, and I think, again, it's because like, when people react uh, negatively, mm -hmm. right, when they say, well, hold on, hang on, what about? And you can, there's lots of things you can point to. Um, I, don't only think, I don't only think that's understandable given our history and given how recent some of these changes are. I think it's honorable. Mm. I actually feel some of that myself. It's uncomfortable. This is an uncomfortable conversation given the current narrative. And the people who are perhaps more, you know, more all in on this, they get frustrated that you have to acknowledge that. Mm. But I think the acknowledgement that this is difficult and that there's another side to it is incredibly important to the conversation. If you want to set the table for the conversation, you can't just go in there and say, it's about time we talked about men and look at these statistics and I read this book from this guy and like, mm. you know, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Talk about the stuff we still need to do for women, share the facts, mm -hmm. talk about whether that's a problem and what to do about it. And so just tonally, mm -hmm. this debate has got to change so that we can, back to, you said about CBS this morning, you don't always agree with it, so that we can disagree without being disagreeable, mm -hmm. to use that, and actually just kind of learn a bit from each other. But people, what I've discovered actually is that, I'll say this bluntly, middle-aged people are more scared of talking about this than young people are, mm. right? A lot of 20-something women, very strong feminists in many cases, don't need much persuading that men are struggling because they're trying to date them. <laughs> uh, and, and honestly, I, I mean, I, yeah, it, but it's true, all right? And the mothers of those women as well. And so actually, I was on a college campus recently, a very liberal college, two-thirds women, 10 percentage point difference in on-time graduation rates in mm. favor of women, um, led by a gay woman chancellor who are doing work on this. They're setting up a task force to work on this. And I met with the student DEI committee. Mm. And by the end of it, they were all, the, all the women were like, oh, hell yeah, we need to do more for the men. So what's happening is that leaders are more afraid than they need to be, actually. And that a lot of the young people out there are much more receptive to it as long as it's done in the right way. So that is... Absolutely, in a room full of over a thousand people, a key takeaway that we must take away. A key takeaway that we must take away. Did yeah. you like that? Yeah, I did Double like that. Takeaway. <laughs> That's uh, right. Yeah. We have to advocate for both. We have right. to understand and advocate um, for both men yes. and for women. Um, let's talk a bit mm. about parents. Mm -hmm. How many boy mom or dads do we have out there? So it's interesting, since reading your book, it has changed how I listen to parents, how I hear them mm -hmm. when they're talking about their young men. Mm -hmm. I'm a girl mom of teenagers. Mm -hmm. My kids are also hot messes. Thank you for okay. acknowledging yours. That's right, it's um, just a science. Is it, it is. But talking to a parent from Louisiana the first night we got here, she didn't know we were, we were gonna have a discussion about this. Mm -hmm. But she just started in on her son yeah. and some of the challenges that she was experiencing. And then last night, speaking to our Speaker of the House, Todd Houston, who's not here so I can talk about him, mm -hmm. um, he was telling us, a group of us, about his son mm -hmm. and some of the really great things, but also uh, as, a, as a dad. So mm -hmm. when we think about parenting young men, um, what is some of the best advice that you could give based on your learnings to all of our parents? Well, um, I'm not going to offer very good advice, I think, as a parent, because I'm not a parenting expert, and because, I've, as I acknowledged earlier, I feel like I've 
made some very big mistakes with my own, my own sons. They're fortunately doing okay now. Um, but so I'd say one thing. First of all, just the observation is that uh, I had the same experience. It's honestly one of the things that led me to do this work is the number of people that would come up would talk privately mm. about some of the issues that their boys were having or their young men were having or their brother was having or their husband was having, um, but not publicly. There was a gap between the private conversations that were taking place and the public conversations that were taking place. And I think part of my contribution with the book, or the, the goal was to try and bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. And the number of people that said to me, well, thank God for that, I thought it was just us. Um, and actually to move away a little bit from just a sense of like, what's wrong with your son, mm. to maybe the systems that he's in aren't quite working very well for him, right? Uh, like my son. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that you're not gonna take, you know, take him out of that system, but it would mean you might advocate for changes in that system Right? So, you know, John won't forgive me if I don't talk about, mention recess, you know, uh, and just the, the pedagogy. Um, so just make sure that you're thinking about it and saying, hang on, this school's not quite working for my son. Well, advocate for him, right? Uh, have compassion for him and advocate for him. Uh, and recognize that may, you may only just support him a little bit more. But it's this interesting thing where, like, once you get people talking about it, it's almost like once they feel they've got permission to talk about it, because you're not going to think that, you know, they've gone off the edge. Um, to talk about it, and you're not going to roll your eyes at them mm. and say, oh, really? Especially if, they're, you know, especially if they're like a white, relatively affluent boy. Really? Seriously? You think he's got problems? Well, actually, yeah, maybe he does have some very deep problems. Problems are not the exclusion, are, are not only felt in one part of our society. So if you give permission, people talk about it. My thing is, this is not just millions of private problems. Mm. It's also a public policy problem. We've got to get this into the, onto the public policy agenda. There's a couple of school districts. I can't, I can't even get their d data by gender. They just don't break it by gender. I'm like, well, I know you've got it. Could you break it by gender? So you do an FOI or whatever. It's like, and again, it's partly it's changed so quickly that people don't think about it necessarily. It's not usually intentional. It's just like, oh, yeah, we never thought, of doing, but we never thought about doing it by gender. Oh, that's interesting. There's a, big agen there's a bigger gender gap in high school graduation than a race gap in some cases. Mm. Interesting. Maybe we should pay attention to both. So you're coming to Indiana in February. I am. Our commissioner for higher education, Chris Lowry, has been studying the educational attainment of men in the state of Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, we need to do better with our data, to be clear, to break down gender more in our state beyond just higher ed, K-12 and otherwise. You mentioned policy, you're pushing policy. You have mm -hmm. a room yes. full of um, key education policy leaders in our country. What are the top handful of policies that we should consider passing with urgency? Yeah, so I'll do it, sort of, I'll focus it on education, but then maybe, maybe we'll make one health recommendation. So in terms of education, there's like what you can do now, given the current structure, right? and I do think that's things like rethinking recess, rethinking school start times. Um, there's some recent evidence that actually starting your high schoolers a little bit later is good for all students, but it seems particularly good for boys. And that might be because they're struggling to go to bed, you know, back to that cortex, frontal cortex thing. I don't know, but um, I think you should do that anyway. Um, so those are things, that, uh, and extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. um, there's a gender gap growing in that. And one reason for that, by the way, is that some st districts and states have a rule that you can't do extracurricular activities if your GPA is below a certain line. A well-intentioned policy, for sure, but remember that GPA chart? Put a line through it and say, everyone to the left of this line is not allowed to do extracurricular. Guess who they're going to be, right? But there's no evidence that boys won't get at least as much benefit from extracurricular activities. And, and actually conditioning access to extracurricular on a grade, I just think that's bad policy. If you've got that, change it. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure there's not pay-to-play extracurricular mm -hmm. around the class gaps, etc. I would love more people to start taking the male teacher shortage seriously. That's obviously more of a medium term thing. Um, but set goals, be intentional in outreach, think about financial incentives, et cetera. Um, and then, as I mentioned about starting schools later, like let's, I mean, you could always opt out of this default, but have a default that maybe you just push back the start date for boys by say six months mm. rather than a year, as I was saying until last night, but maybe by six months and then do a really strong evaluation uh, of that. Those are the kinds of things I would do. The only other thing I'll, I'll point out, and these are kind of data points, join me in lobbying the Department for Education to ask states to report their on-time high school graduation rates by gender. 
Say it again. By when? By gender. Oh, by gender. Yeah. States are required yeah. to report that high school graduation rates by race, foster care status, English or second they are not required to report by gender or sex. So I don't know what the on-time high school graduation rate is of boys in America. Can I add a little element to that? Most of the states in here have ways that, that schools can statistically sidestep graduation. In Indiana, we have a waiver. We also must study, if you have multiple diploma types, we must look at gender with that You as have well to break it down. Yes, and that's yes. why I focus on on-time high school graduation rates. Yes. Right? Conditional on, you start then, have you, have you uh, graduated four years later? There are other measures, but that's a really tight measure. It's the best one, and I can't get it because we don't ask the states to, re to report it even though they generally have it. Now, could I have made a wonkier point? I apologize. But it's just like an example of like no one intended that. But then it means I can't do it by race, race as well mm. and gender. I don't know the on-time high school graduation rate for black boys or Hispanic girls. Just report the data, please. And then the second thing I'll say is there's a health one, and this is tough because it's a national level thing. You've heard a lot from John Hyatt and others about the rise in teen girls' mental health problems. Yes. Under the Affordable Care Act, screening for anxiety for girls and women is covered uh, without cost. It's covered for free by the Affordable Care Act. Screening for anxiety among boys and men is not. Wow. And one reason wow. we might be picking up more of the anxiety among teen girls, this policy was introduced in 2012, might be because we're screening better for it. Because now it's cost-free, the, the primary care providers and others are building it into their standard screening, knowing that they can code it and they'll get paid for it. It's free. It's not free for boys and men. Mm. It's not covered. And so, again, was that, was that because a feminist cabal in the Obama White House said, here's how we screw the men over? <laughs> <laughs> they've had, well, had 10,000 so, years <laughs> of oppressing us, so it's about time. No. No. That didn't happen. It was an accident of the policy architecture about the way that preventive health care is covered in the US. There's a women's preventive health initiative that makes proposals that, if, it, if accepted, are covered by the ACA. There is no equivalent for men for political reasons to do with the ACA and contraception and Republican support. Long story. The result, though, is that we're just doing a much better job of screening for anxiety among girls and boys. I think that's morally wrong. I don't see strong evidence on the face that, there's, that the differences in anxiety levels are so great. But here's the real problem. If you start screening one group and not the other, you find more in that group. And then you report it. And then it gets headlines. And then people come up to me and say, no, I think teen boys are fine. It's all the teen girl stuff, isn't it? Like, Hold on. Maybe we don't know. And maybe you haven't looked at suicide rates. But also, maybe public policy is inadvertently screened. Now, I don't know what can be done about that at a state level. And it's a health thing, not an education thing. Mm. But it's a nice illustration of an inadvertent gender bias that's crept into public policy. So I am going to open it up to the room for some questions. I do have a couple more so people can start thinking. Mm -hmm. You talked about needing to get more men into the heel yes. areas. You've mentioned that several times. Mm. Um, and specifically, teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, as states, invested a, a lot of money in many respects to recruit uh, more black teachers, mm -hmm. more Hispanic teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've had varying results in, in how quickly we've been able to do that. How do we um, recruit male, teacher, male teachers or even men into the heel areas mm -hmm. as quickly as possible? I don't know. Well, you said that a lot in your book, too. <laughs> yes. You didn't know. Yeah, yeah it's amazing which how, how little I know. I circled <laughs> every time you Did said you? it. You oh, want to know how many you said right. it? You're, you're doing the, this is like the worst sales it's pitch like for therapy. my book I'm I have sorry. ever had. Sorry. Like my, you're, the only person worse than you is my wife who read it. Well. And, and, she, and she put, we were sitting at dinner with one of my sons, and she put, she scribbled in the margins of a printed out copy. And, and, uh, and I read it. And I said, honey, it says here that this, you say this whole section is horribly opaque and adds no value. <laughs> and my uh, son looked up from his phone and said, are you talking about dad again? <laughs> 
They're funny, aren't they, these boys? Uh. Um, I don't know. Uh, because we haven't tried, by and large, and if we have tried, we haven't evaluated our attempts. Right? Before, you, before I would confidently say, I think you should do this, right? I would want us to have done that and evaluated that mm. and shown it to work. You know, call me boring. But that's the approach. That said, so let's, there are some things happening, mm. including in some school districts where they've committed to in, in, increasing the share of, of men of color, especially in teachers. Mm -hmm. What did they do? Did it work? Could we try, I was just somewhere, an education school that is 95% female, desperately trying to get more men in. I said, well, how about doing some different marketing, have some different marketing materials that stretch, you know, make it more gender equal. How about sending some men out into those schools and do that for half the schools in your district and not the other half and see what happens. Mm. Just randomize it, right? See whether those sorts of nudges can help. I don't know. The second thing I'll say is, so commit to it, acknowledge mm. it's a problem, try some stuff. The other really big issue with all the heel professions is that they require lots of training mm -hmm. and they don't generally pay that well. And so what that means is that very few 17-year-old boys think, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to spend seven years in higher education and then earn $50,000 a year, right? Which is what's true for like, They don't think like that, mm. right? And, they, and because they're not trained to sort of think about social work or healthcare as a thing. So what, what the, the result of that is that a disproportionate share of the men who do enter those professions do so later. Mm. So the lateral moves into those professions, into education, how easy or hard is it to laterally move into it mm. is a big question. And I just have a friend who's been in tech, he's done very well in tech, and he wants to go and teach computer science in a school, disadvantaged public school. He's been in tech for 15 years, he's got to go these credentials, fine. But the thing that really kicked him in the teeth mm -hmm. was that his 15 years in the technology industry weren't going to count against his pay. Right? He was going to get like four years. So it wasn't like... He wasn't only being asked to earn what a 40-year-old public school teacher earns, he was being asked to earn what a 26-year-old public mm. school teacher earns. And he's like, oh. And so those sorts of things, again, they're not deliberate, but if they are disproportionately hurting us from getting more men in, then we should look at them. Mm. One more question, we're opening it up. I shared with you a little about my dad. He is mm. a very important person in my life. Um, he talks a lot less than I do, and he's more patient. But I have, I like so him I still already. have a lot to learn from him. Did he like my book? I, he hasn't read it, but I talked okay. to him about tell, it. Tell, he I, would. I want to hear his take on he my book. He totally would. Okay, you <laughs> say this, and this is really, really interesting to me. You say you talk a lot about fatherhood. Yes. And you say rather than looking in the rearview mirror. We need to establish a new basis for fatherhood, one that embraces the huge progress we have made toward gender equality. So my question, why do we need a new basis for fatherhood and what does that look like? We need a new basis for fatherhood because in my father's generation, the roles of husband, father, and breadwinner were essentially bundled together, right? He knew what it meant to be a father. It meant to be the breadwinner, <laughs> um, and he was. Uh, and that meant when he was unable to do so, that was very difficult for him. Um, but the roles were clear. Uh, you, you, you're married, you, you're the breadwinner, and you raise the kids together, right? So fatherhood was, was bundled together. Now, you saw the stats on marriage and fatherhood. We live in a world where Gloria Steinem has won. Gloria Steinem said the goal of the women's movement is to make marriage a choice rather than a necessity. I'm not saying we've reached gender equality in the labor market yet, but 40% of women now earn more than the median man. So it's not 50%, it's not equality, but 40%. In 79, it was 13%. I'm just going to tell you, a world where almost half of women earn almost as much as almost half of men is a very different world. Right? And so that sense of economic independence that the women's movement has delivered to many women is a glorious, wonderful, liberating, triumphant thing. Mm -hmm. But it has put a question mark next to the men, as the conservatives warned at the time that it would. Their answer is, don't let it happen. If you let these women do this thing, the men will be hopeless and lost, and they'll be despairing uh, and maybe violent. And like, you, don't, you don't want men who are... Right. So they were warning about that. 
I don't think that's the right solution, but I think the solution is to say dads matter, period. Mm. Sure, you can be married, and that's definitely easier and better. Melissa Carney's book shows that. But it shouldn't be a requirement. Mm. Because if we say to men, if you're not married, you've already failed as a father, we bench most of our dads. Mm. And we need fatherhood programs that acknowledge them as fathers. The evidence for fathers mattering, especially to adolescents, is huge. Uh, and for a while, people were reluctant to say that, dads matter, for fear of being heteronormative or somehow being against same-sex couples or whatever. The evidence is in. Dads matter. Every dad matters.